United States Navy reveals the latest in rocket development at the proving grounds in the state of Virginia. Each 1,200 pound projectile used by America's land, sea, and air forces has the power of a large naval shell. To a fighter plane, the new rocket gives the force of a battleship. Here is the latest rapid-fire launcher. Shooting two five-inch rockets in salvo, the apparatus can be accurately aimed and reloaded without delay from below. landing craft equipped with rocket launchers becomes a mighty warship. Cleared for action, she has the firepower of five destroyers. <laughs> News from Buenos Aires. Just three years after Argentina's military clique seized power, Colonel Juan Perón signs the book to become Argentina's 29th president. From General Edelmiro Farrell, retiring president, he receives the mace and sash of office. Looking on is Madame Perón, the president's wife, as her husband pledges unshakable maintenance of Argentine sovereignty. Now Argentina's armed forces pass in review before the new chief executive. Just two days after the inauguration came the news that Soviet Russia had resumed diplomatic relations with Argentina. <laughs> President Perón was bitterly opposed by the liberal parties, but achieved large popular support. fuselage for the world's largest aircraft leaves its hangar in California to begin the 24-mile overland journey to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. One wing alone measures 165 feet, and the huge seaplane, when completed, will be powered by eight 3,000-horsepower engines. En route to a special graving dock, linesmen cut wires and shift poles to provide clearance for the huge plane. Mammoth hull will rest in this graving dock while the plane is assembled. As yet unnamed, the craft was designed as a cargo carrier, but it could be easily adapted to transport 700 passengers. This, the latest and largest transport plane, opens new horizons in man's conquest of the skies. At Luxembourg Palace in Paris, after a month's recess, the Council of Foreign Ministers of France, Britain, Russia, and the United States meets in conference. French Minister Bidot is chairman. <laughs> Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan of Great Britain, and representing the Soviet government, Foreign Minister Molotov. Although there was little agreement at the first meeting, United States Secretary Byrne's motion to deal with the Austrian peace treaty has this time been carried. The ministers take their places. Recent strife in Italy presents new problems. Here in the Victor Hugo Salon of Luxembourg Palace, the Big Four Council begins to lay the foundations for the final peace treaties. Palestine, storm center of world opinion, another shipload of refugees from Europe find a new home. Only 1,500 Jewish immigrants a month may now enter Palestine. 
In the wake of disagreements over the Palestine question came fierce controversies and conflict. The question of Palestine must still remain on the world's agenda. And closely related news comes from nearby Transjordan. In its mountain capital, Amman, this country of some 400,000 celebrates its greatest holiday in a quarter of a century. Long administered by the British under a League of Nations mandate, today Transjordan gets word that Britain will establish its independence. At the King's Palace, dignitaries arrive for the ceremonies. Though Transjordan's status is changing, Britain still maintains certain development rights in the country. The King, Emir Abdullah, who completed negotiations for the treaty, leads the way for a review of Arab troops. In Transjordan, new evidence of Britain's changing policies. To New York City's Hunter College and the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission comes Bernard M. Baruch. Key figure in two world wars and advisor to presidents, the 75-year-old statesman brings his plan for the atomic age. Among those at the historic meeting are Major General Groves and other military and civilian experts. Mr. Baruch chats with Trigby Lee, Secretary General of the United Nations. Now he outlines the position of the United States and calls for an international law to deal with the control and development of atomic energy. We propose this. One, manufacture of atomic bombs shall stop. Two, existing bombs shall be disposed of pursuant to the terms of the treaty. <coughs> and three, the authority shall be in possession of full information as to the know-how for the production of atomic knowledge. We are here to make a choice between the quick and the dead. That is our business. Behind the black portent of the new atomic age lies a hope which, seized upon with faith, can work our salvation. If we fail, then we have damned every man to be the slave of fear. Let us not deceive ourselves. We must elect world peace or world destruction.